relatively high voltages and some of you with high voltage on water. Uh, and if you were with Jack last night, probably drinking uh, some spirits. That's a dangerous combination. What I'm going to talk about here, and uh, then allow the panel to help add, answer questions, and the panel doesn't know, uh, they haven't seen the presentation, so this is going to be new for them. In my mind, this presentation is more dangerous than high voltage and drinking. Uh, because this is dealing with money. And so I'll, I'll warn you up front that what I'm about to say you have to use in conjunction with common sense, just like you do with high voltage and drinking. You have to use some common sense. And I call this uh, driving the EV business, or any business for that matter, the keys to success or the things you were never taught in school. In um, 1988, I sold a computer business that was doing, uh, the year that I sold it, they did $40 million at 42% gross profit. Uh, times are good. You can't help but have a good time when you're bringing in more money than you know how to spend. The day I sold the business, I went out to lunch with people that were buying the business and uh, let the lawyers continue to work over lunch and run up their outrageous fees. And at lunch, I opened up a fortune cookie that I've saved the paper from. And the paper said, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. Now, if I asked everyone in here, uh, what is success to you? You know, somebody volunteered, what, what is being successful mean to somebody in here? 15 pound bass. What was that? 15 pound bass. 15 pound bass. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that too. <laughs> there are some things money can't buy. <laughs> you got two fishermen going. <laughs> Come on, back in the EV land. There are some things money can't buy, but money can buy a lot of things. Um, money can't buy happiness. But a lot of people view success as making a lot of money. And uh, so if that is your view, I'm going to tell you the secret on how to do it. Uh, and I have to go back and relate a little bit of a story to you. Um, in 1984, uh, when I left Bell Laboratories in Naperville, there were 6,500 employees in Naperville, a great facility. I'd been there for almost, I started my 15th year was the highest level staff manager in the building and I was 33 years old. Things were good. You know, how could it get any, any better than that? And uh, I opened my mouth at the wrong time and accepted a job, not even realizing that they were going to accept my outrageous demands. They did, and I ended up leaving uh, a company that I, I really enjoyed working for to start my own business. And uh, I felt like starting my own business, it's kind of like juggling a whole bunch of balls. You've got to worry about payables, receivables, uh, salaries, inventory, uh, all sorts of other things. And I felt like I was doing this on top of the pyramid. And, and one side of the pyramid, if I, if I fell, one side of the pyramid was going to be success if I was lucky and the other slope was going to be uh, bankruptcy, right? And, and if you stopped and sat down, you were going to get the point of that pyramid someplace you didn't want it. So what are the keys to success? The first key to success, and there's no getting around this, is hard work. I didn't realize just how hard the work was. But this contract that I accepted when I left Bell Laboratories, the first week on the job, I'm in Washington, D.C., and the owners of the company, the president, the vice president, the CEO, all come out to watch me perform and see how I do. And uh, the Thursday night before I left, we went out to a bar uh, to discuss my performance. And uh, they said, so how do you like the job? And I said, well, you double my Bell Labs salary, I have to work 26 weeks a year. You pick me up in a limo, you fly me first class, you put me up in four-star hotels, I have an unlimited expense account. What's not to like? You know, I feel like I'm rich. 
And they laughed, which was kind of surprising. And they said, you're not rich. There's only one way you get rich. And uh, I said, what's that? They said, buy us a beer and um, we'll tell you the secret. And I go, what have I got to lose? Well, this is a bar in Washington, D.C., right? Beers are six bucks a piece. You know, four beers, and you've got a lot to lose. You know, you're talking 30 bucks a, a round, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's a country boy. You know, this is quite different to me. And they say, uh, I think I'll get to that in a minute. I'll tell you more about the secret coming up. But the first part of the secret was you can work for a small, you can work for a big company like AT&T and have lots of security, lots of benefits, and a good salary, but you'll never get rich. The keys to success, hard work, dedication, um, knowledge, Here's the interesting part of this is the knowledge, that's why you're coming to ED kind of. You know, you're, you are getting the keys to success being here. You're obviously dedicated. You need experience. You're all building EDs. You know, one of the things that NetGate requires of its dealers is we won't set you up as a dealer until you've built an electric vehicle. Uh, <coughs> you have to have experience building electric vehicles. You have to have the drive. You know, and I, 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 you can look at Jack Rickard as an example of this. Jack doesn't have to be doing this, right? But there's something driving him in this direction. You have to have the right attitude. And um, I tell the people in the office that when you pick up the phone, when the phone rings and you pick up the phone, you have a smile on your face because the people on the other end of the line can hear that smile. Attitude is important. Your customers will know what your attitude is. Your timing needs to be perfect. Timing is difficult. Your timing is correct. Our timing is correct. The economy is, is hurting us right now. If we were in a good economy, um, times would be much better for everyone here. But we have any and economic, uh, an economy right now that is making it difficult for a lot of the uh, dealers that we have. And of course, luck. And people say you make your own luck, you're making it today by being here. It's, it's attending an event like this, it's um, gaining the knowledge, gaining the experience, Making your own luck. Making your own luck is making contacts. You know, it's, it's so that you can come and talk to Sebastian, talk to Jack, find out what products are going to be available. You're making your own luck. So these are some of the keys to success. But there's also, being successful, there's also a lot of dirty work. Uh, you have to be willing to um, deal with the accounting aspects of this. If, if you're going to start a business, I'm hoping that a lot of you are looking at starting some kind of an electric motor account business, you're going to be dealing with inventories, you're going to be dealing with accounts payable, accounts receivable, uh, the balance sheet, customers, and um, customers are not always the easiest people in the world to deal with. You know, you, you still have to deal with them with a smile on your face. And all of their questions, their phone calls, and all of their problems that go along with that. If you're serious and you want to be successful, the paperwork associated with inventory accounts payable, accounts receivable, balance sheet, you've got to start right at the very beginning and you're going to want to do um, quarterly financials. You're going to want to do quarterly financials for a couple of reasons. Number one, to, um, to get familiar with them if you don't know how to read a balance sheet. I, I was fortunate in my business that I had uh, the president of a company that some of you probably, that's gone now, but a company called Dyson. Jack, you probably remember Dyson. Uh, Phil Michichi was uh, the president, the guy who took me under his wing. And he came out one day and said, you know, let's take a look at your balance sheet. And sat me down and taught me how to look at 
people's balance sheets, which helps you evaluate whether or not you want to do business with someone. So if you want to expand your business, you're going to have to go to banks, you're going to have to talk to banks, and you're going to have to pay attention to these balance sheets. And part of the dirty work that you're going to have to do is something called documentation. And Jack doesn't know it, but I'm going to use uh, his documentation to show you something. If you're doing a conversion on an electric vehicle, give the customer something like this. Maybe Jack will you know, put up the source for this or something in open office format. So that all you have to do is plug in your pictures. And most of you probably haven't seen this, but uh, this is on the special edition that, that Jack has done. And there's an introduction, there's wiring diagrams, there's all the specifications. Give your customers something like this. I mean, they deserve it, they're paying for the conversion. Uh, Jack went above and beyond and, and actually has dynamometer data in here. But um, I'm going to put this on the table over here. Uh, I don't know that Jack has ever made this available. I don't know if you want to make this available. But this is a great asset for dealers who, you know, want to do the dirty work and actually do the documentation. Seb has to do documentation on the controllers. You know, this is, this is the, the dirty work that no one wants to do is that documentation. And it's really essential. So what are the steps to success? Choosing the right business. It's, it's more than just choosing the right business because there's a cost of entry into any business. Uh, the, the space, if you have the rent space, the tools, the technical expertise, and the business expertise that I talked about on the, on the prior page, the business expertise is a lot of times where a lot of businesses fail. They're, they're good at doing the technical work, but you know, I don't want to do a, uh, an inventory tonight. You know, I don't want to do an accounts payable. I don't want to pay my bills tonight. The creditors can wait for another week. No, they can't. You gotta be on top of this stuff. stuff. And, it, and it helps if you have uh, a significant other that'll work with you or you know, hopefully you'll be big enough to uh, actually have employees. Uh, but when you're looking for the right business, you want to look for competition. Uh, look at your competition. There isn't a lot of competition in this industry, but it is a very small uh, niche market. So you want to do an assessment of your technical capabilities, your business capabilities, and what are the offerings that you have? What's going to bring customers to you? Now, the things that are never taught in school. How to choose a lawyer. The lawyer is going to be working for you, right? And you go out and you pick a lawyer, and picking a lawyer is critical. You should ask the lawyer for a transcript of their grades. Remember, 50% of the lawyers finished in the bottom half of their class. <laughs> you know? Ask the lawyer for a transcript. Ask him what his specialties are. Know what his specialties are. The same thing for an accountant. They're your employee. Get a good one. Choosing a bank. Choosing a bank of, of the, the three things that I put up here so far, choosing a bank is really critical. I didn't know how for long. Uh, I have to tell you a quick story. When I started my computer business, uh, I got a purchase order for about three hundred thousand dollars from Illinois Bell to buy Dyson Magnetic Media, big disc packs. My cost on that was about two hundred and seventy thousand dollars, so I was only making ten percent, but. $30,000 for taking an order is something that we'd all, we'd all like to do. So I went to the bank that I'd been dealing with and uh, had my home mortgage through it, dealing with them for years. It was, uh, I think it was actually called Washington Bank in Naperville. And I'd been there for years and years. And I walked in and I said, look at this, $300,000 purchase order, I'm making 10%. Just give me my $270,000 and I'll pay Dysan. Dysan will ship the disks. And by the way, if I prepay Dysan, Dysan will cover the shipping, which is another $20,000. So I'm going to make $50,000 on this $300,000 transaction. So, you know, please give me $250,000. And the bank looked at it. 
Illinois, remember this is Illinois Bell that I'm selling to, so you're pretty sure you're going to get paid. And the bank said, well, we'll give you 70% of your cost, 18.5% interest. Uh, of course, we want a second mortgage on your house. And we'll let you know in two weeks. And I said, no, that's not going to work. I have to have the discs there in two weeks. I can't wait two weeks for a decision. They'll go somewhere else if I can't deliver it. And I said, well, that's the best we can do. I, I, I had no idea that it was going to be this difficult. I figured, if you walk in with a purchase order, you can finance your, re your receivables, right? So I start driving back to my office, and I see Naperville Bank. I go, well, what have I got to lose? I've all talked to commercial loans here. And I walk in, laid out the same package to them, and they said, 12% will let you know in a week. And I go, how did I go from 18% to 12% and from two weeks to one week? And we'll give you 90% of your cost. Well, 90% of my cost of, of $270,000 meant that I still had to come up with $27,000, $25,000. I, I was a little business. I couldn't come up with $25,000. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what's going on here? So I'm heading back to the office, and I call the office, and I said, I'll be right back. And I go, oh, wait, here's another bank, Harris Bank, Naperville. Might as well see what they have to say. So I pull in, had no appointment, talk to their corporate loans people, and uh, he took a look at everything, and he said, yeah, half point over prime, we'll let you know in two days, <laughs> and uh, we want your business account here. I go, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I said and I said to him, and you know, just to show you how naive I was, I probably shouldn't have opened my mouth, I, uh, I probably just should have lived with it, and I said, you know, Scott, can you tell me what happened with, you know, earlier in the day with 18 and a half, 12 percent, and from 70 uh, percent, we'll loan you 70 percent, to we'll loan you 90 percent, to we'll loan you 100 percent of your, your cost? He goes, well, yeah, sure. Those were smaller banks. Smaller banks, he said, banks can only lend you something at, that they call the legal lending limit. Based on their assets, they're only allowed to issue, to give enough credit to, or a, a limit to each customer. And the first bank that I was dealing with had a legal lending limit of $170,000, which I didn't know until I talked to Scott. And he said, um, so they, they were giving me the best deal they could, and their board only meets every two weeks. He said, Harris Bank is a big bank, you know, we meet a couple times a week, so that's why we can tell you in two days. And we've got a legal lending limit of $2 million. If it goes beyond that, we go to Harris Bank Chicago, which at that time had a legal lending limit of $20 million. If it goes beyond that, we go to Bank of Montreal, which had a $2 billion lending limit. I said, you know, who knew that about banks? You know, did anybody, how many of you knew about banks' legal lending limits? I had no idea. You know, very few, <laughs> unless you've run into it. But it's important as you're trying to finance your growth. Employees. The thing is you never taught in school and that you only learn in business is that the most important thing you have in your business is not your inventory, it's your employees. Uh, it's not your inventory, it's not your customers. So many people think that your customers are your most important assets. Your employees are your most important asset, and I guarantee it. Your employees will get you customers. Never underestimate the value of your employees and treat them the way that they deserve to be treated. Now, most small businesses fail because of something I call the fear of zeros. If you need to borrow $1,000, probably everyone in this room can go out and borrow $1,000. It's not a problem. You need to borrow $10,000, all of you are going to sit back and go, oh, do I really want to borrow $10,000? But you can probably do it. When it comes to borrowing $100,000, you're thinking, oh boy, my house, I can lose my house, this, that. What happens when you got to borrow a million dollars? Well, funny thing happens right around this point because um, a 
a lot of people, a, lot, a large portion of the population don't have a, a net worth of, of more than a million dollars. Although your net worth is far greater than you think when you really add it up. But what's the difference between all these numbers? Zeros. What's a zero worth? Zero. Get over the fear of zeros. That's all I can tell you. Get over the fear of zeros. Because when you get over the fear of zeros, you realize that at $100,000, the bank owns you. If you go bankrupt, if something happens to you, they're going to take everything you have. They're not going to get any more than a million. They're not going to get any more than $10 million. But an interesting thing happens. At a million plus dollars, the bank becomes your partner. They don't want to see you fail. Right? At $100,000, if you fail, oh, well, we'll take this house. Right? At $10 million, they can take your house, but uh, they're still only getting you know, the fixed value. Now, I'm not, I said this is dangerous, use common sense. I'm not telling everybody to go out and borrow $10 million. Not that you could, but uh, get over the fear of zeros is what I'm telling you. If you want to be successful, you've got to get over that fear of zeros. I'm missing a slide here. Okay, so if you're successful, first of all, I, I, I had another view graph in here that, that uh, showed um, the business starting as a snowflake. And, uh, and then there was, a, it was kind of cute. There was a picture of a monkey making a snowball. Not that I think that you were monkeys. But there was a picture of a monkey making a snowball and actually showing how that snowflake grew into a snowball as the, as the business got bigger and then grew in and had a kid pushing a big snowball and it had a group of college students pushing this big snowball up, up a hill. And that's what it feels like as you're growing your business. Jack used an analogy yesterday that's like pushing a, a freight car up a hill. And um, I always said it's like pushing a snowball up a hill. This thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And finally, you get to the pinnacle and you think, ah, I got it made. Well, you don't want to be, in Jack's case, you know, holding onto that freight car as it's going down the hill or in front of the snowball as it's running down the hill. It, it'll over, it, it's easy for businesses to grow to the point where they can overrun you. But you also want to watch out for the sunshine. Um, a lot of small businesses get to the point where they think the owners think they've got it made. I'm going to go to Hawaii for the next month. Um, and, and I can tell you an example real close to home of one of my very close friends that is in the office one week out of every six. <laughs> and it's driving me crazy <laughs> because he has a home in Florida and a home in Michigan and uh, he travels on vacation one week a month. And um, that man's name is Jerry Warfield, so you might figure out what company he's at. He's not watching out for the sunshine. You know, he, he's, he's doing so much business that he's letting his people run the business. And, he, and, and from my impression, he really needs to be spending more time there. So what is the secret? The secret is you can work for a small com company, and when you work for a small company, you probably have some security, you'll have a salary, you'll have some benefits. When you work for a large company, you usually have good security, good benefits, and a decent salary, but you won't get rich. So how do you get rich? Well, I asked the same question, and they said, buy us another round of beers. Another round of beers comes, another $30. And they said, well, you work for your own company. And, um, your security benefits and salaries are up to you. But just working for your own company isn't going to make you rich. You have to do it in a certain way. I said, what's that? I said, well, buy us another round of beers. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, I know the punchline that's coming here is you start a bar and you charge $6 a beer, right? <laughs> that's how you get rich. But that wasn't the secret. The secret is, and if there's anyone in here that can't keep a secret, you know, please leave. But the secret is, 
if you really want to be successful, you start a business and you build that business with the intention of selling it off. Put a few million dollars in the bank, go to Hawaii, take it easy, do whatever you want. If you're like Jack and you can't sleep at night because you have to be working, start another business, build it. But the secret to getting rich is that ability to build a business, and most people can't do that. Most people that start a small business and build it, it becomes part of them. It's their child. I can't let this business go. I can't, somebody, if I give it to somebody else, it's going to fail. Yeah, if you've got $10 million in the bank, you know, you don't care if that fails because you can start it and do it again. So the questions, what we have for a panel up here, and the reason that I've invited uh, these three gentlemen is because they're all serial entrepreneurs. Michael Green, uh, Gravity Skateboard Company, Randall Truck, that makes the trucks, so you went beyond just the boards, uh, made the trucks for the skateboards, and now E.B. West. Uh, Sebastian, uh, Technosolis, uh, started Rebirth Auto, decided to make controllers, uh, Evnetics, and uh, our host, We know his history. <laughs> so I think we have a panel of um, experts, and this isn't to say that there aren't experts out there. I know that there are some, some very good business people sitting in the audience. These are three people that I know and I feel comfortable with, and that's why I asked them to join me up here. But any questions, um, you, have a, you have a unique opportunity to learn something other than electric vehicles while you're here through the, through the various people that are here. Um, so I would say if you have any questions. I'd like to chat a little bit before we get to the audience questions. I agree with pretty much everything George said. I view it kind of from a different perspective. Um, there was a guy who started an electronic bullet board system years ago in Madison, Wisconsin, I think. His name is Bob Mahoney. Some guys are so bright, they're right on this near edge of madness. And he kind of goes back and forth over the line. But he uh, started a bullet board system and started charging people for access to it. It was called Exec PC. Some of you may even remember it. It was the largest software thing. He told me one day, he said, Jack, Wanting to have money and be rich is not a sufficiently complex set of goals to hang a wife on. And I thought that was an honest thing. Well, everybody wants money, don't they? And I thought about it a long time. Have lived kind of a long time since then. And he was exactly right. And I started looking, and I, in the kind of a privileged position with the computer industry and so forth, I got to see a lot of people make a lot of money. And I ha happened to notice that most of them didn't seem to care anything about money. George got it, made his product announcement, and he said, I'm really excited. And he started to say something else and didn't say it. What, what he didn't say was, I'm really excited, and I'm really petrified uh, to make this uh, new business move. And he's almost shaking here. That's like being a compulsive gambler. It's so much juice, you get addicted to it. And so the world is divided into kind of two groups. I call them the players and the rest of the population. And most of the population works to pay their utility bills. And they want a job, and they want health benefits, and so forth. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with this, by the way because they can have families and dogs. And, and happiness, by the way, is a completely separate thing from success, money, and so forth. But out of that population, and, and what's critical to understand, and I, I fear some of our leadership in the country do not understand, is that our entire economy is driven by the innovators I call players. They are addicted to the game. They start one business and they will run that business 
and, and understand there's some costs here to the point where uh, a telephone makes them jump three and a half feet in the air, they're near a heart attack and they're going to have a nervous breakdown. That's the timing, that's when you sell that business, you go fishing for two years, and they always want to come back and start another. These good people that start the serial entrepreneur, half of them don't even know how much money they've got. I couldn't tell you plus or minus eight million bucks today. Uh, I have found, and George does this, whether you realize it or not, women view money completely differently, and they love to count it and take care of it, and they're very good at it. So get a gal and let her handle the check. <laughs> the money is a way of keeping score. This is how your customers and clients tell you what you're doing is important. You should do more of this. Or you have a great idea for a product and everybody says, but I don't want to give you any money for it. That means this is not important and you shouldn't be doing much of this. And so guys use money to keep score. And it's like decimal sincerity. If you come up to me and tell me, Jack, I love you, man. You're doing the greatest stuff. This is the greatest thing in the world. Man, this is really cool. I love to hear that. And it's not that I disbelieve you. If you come up and hand me a thousand dollars and say, Jack, I want one of these and you should be doing more of these. That's speaking to me in decimal. It's not that I need or want the money. I know your motivations exactly. And we don't do free because we can't trust the motivations. I asked Andrew McCoy to come up and videotape this because people wanted that. So he offered to do it for free. I said, we don't do free, Andrew. Here, I'll give you a thousand bucks, pay your airfare, but just come do this for me, will you? Okay, yeah, sure. You still can get why I did that. We don't even accept free. If you try to give me something, I don't want it. I don't know your motivations. But the players are in it for the game. And the game goes like this. Find something you really like to do. And it helps if you kind of feel a commitment to a higher purpose or goal. A mission. Something you can believe in. Doesn't matter how valid the mission is, it's how valid it is to you. Something you believe would change the world or make it better from your perspective and that you like to do it. Step two is do a hell of a lot of it until you get really good at it. And step three, people send you money in the mail. I don't know why, I don't know where it comes from. I'm not sure what you're doing. But that's the game. And you pay a price to be one of the players, and you pay a price to be one of the employees. And you have to decide which group you want to be in. And, and the players, yeah, you get rich. You get rich over and over. Get rich, lose it all, and get rich again. I know guys who've been through this mill seven times. They've lost their house, their wife, and everything. And, and then two years later, there's another four hundred million dollars. Jack, and that was the point that you know what we're dealing with in this session is more dangerous than high voltage. Electric. Yes, it is. It's kind of like it's, it's, it's your life and your family. High voltage and, and uh, going for a drive. Yeah. And you're exactly right. So make sure you want to be in this player category, because there's a price. You can come near to a nervous breakdown, you can come near to a heart attack, and understand, my wife, my ex-wife, all my kids, they know their position in the world. They are not number one. It's all about me. <laughs> I am the focus, I'm the center of attention, we're headed for the mission, and nothing gets in the way. Total obsession to detail. Um, every entrepreneurial organization I've ever been around that was successful had an autocratic, over controlling, detail obsessive asshole at the center of it. If you don't know who that is in your organization, it's you. <laughs> and if you don't have one of those, and you're working in an organization that doesn't have one of those, quit and go align yourself with one of those guys because they're in motion going to do something. There's only 12,000 of these guys in the country. And they drive everything, believe it or not. And right now in our economy, 9,000 of them are fishing and recovering. 
because they don't know what's going on. They need a break anyway. And nobody's going to tax them or take any of it away. They can just move around wherever they want it. Jack, do you think that they're also looking for an opportunity? That's why they're fishing. They're just waiting for that opportunity. They're looking for the right market. George, they do not spend a waking moment that isn't looking for opportunity. But timing is part of it, too. And you do need to recover for a couple of years. If the environment's not right, the tax structure, Obamacare, whatever it is, why don't I just fish for a while and see what happens? And they're always, every waking moment, thinking, looking for the opportunity. You know, we, we didn't mention one thing, which is satisfaction. You have to get some satisfaction out of what you're doing. If you're not getting satisfaction out of what you're doing, if you're not getting satisfaction of where, where you're working, I, I agree completely, and I want to go back to your first thing, which is hard work. I've had seven hours sleep since Monday. <laughs> I work 100 hours a week. It's not hard at all. In fact, I'm addicted to it. And the reason is, I'm focused on doing this and addicted to doing this. If I work 30 hours for you, it's hard work. If I work 120 hours for me and where I'm going, it ain't work at all. It just starts early in the day. It ends late in the day, usually with a knee buckling. That's when I go down. <laughs> and if I'm here, if I get up more and do it again. You know, uh, Jack, I, I want to hear from, from Michael and Seth. You know, Mike, Mike was kind of a, a laid back California surfer dude. And, uh, but I'll tell you, this guy works hard. Yeah, he busts his ass. Um, and, you know, um, having Jack and George here has a ton of experience on the stage. And you did a wonderful job of hitting on uh, pretty much all the important key points. And uh, one small thing that I can add to that, uh, especially as you're getting into this and kind of new, is ask for advice. Use resources like Jack and George, uh, business consultants, there's some called SCORE, uh, the Senior Corps of Retired Executives. Uh, they'll volunteer their time to help you. Just really stay open to that, stay open to suggestions and information from other people, uh, such as Jack and George. So how about giving us some well, advice? I really haven't gotten to the fishing part, so I can't call myself successful, really. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, I like the sickness idea, frankly, because I think that's what it is. Uh, you know, since some people ask often, you know, when, when I meet them, you know, they, they, they see what I do and they, they approach it with, uh, isn't it great to be your own boss and, you know, do whatever you want to do whenever you want to do it. And, and it is, it is great, but it comes into, you know, as, as Jack points out, uh, a significant personal cost that, you know, I'm actually much less uh, talented than people that surround me. But uh, in order to get to where I'm at, I have to work twice as hard as everybody. So it's a, it's, it's a significant commitment that I think can't be overlooked. Uh, other than that, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't really, you know, you walk, you walk into uh, uh, an opportunity with uh, a certain vision or division kind of blossoms inside of your head and then it can't leave until it gets done and that's really what drives us. You know, that, that, no, I mean, it's singing myself, but yeah. sing on. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm, not very, I'm not an easy uh, speaker, so it's a little difficult for me to put it in perspective. But uh, I think uh, George points out that uh, the quality of the people that surround you really help you, you know, accomplish your vision, and that can't really be overlooked. You know, in our case at Athletics, you know, Jeff uh, joined us as a partner, and uh, partner in Sweden uh, making uh, the software because made it possible for, for the vision of our product to come to fruition. That's pretty much the same thing in everything we do, but um, the obsession is what uh, I think uh, keeps me together. And I, I, you know, uh, I don't know if I'd be able to, to fish, frankly. Uh, and that's, really, that's really the problem. You know? But uh, it's, it's good. It's, it's the way I can't deny my nature. And uh, I think Seth pointed out being humble helps. <laughs> Do you have a question? Yes. Uh, Mark Bush, California. Oh, oh. Uh, 
Uh, Mark Bush, uh, California. Um, I'm going to ask all four of you, do you have any formal education in business? And is that, a, is, is that a, something that we should look at? Um, I'll start. Um, no, I don't. Actually, I'm a computer engineer. Uh, and uh, when I started uh, my first business 18 years ago, uh, I had no business experience and I didn't realize um, how, how important it was, and not so much from the numbers, those become easy to an engineer, but really the social interactions and a lot of the uh, managerial structure and things like that uh, that I didn't have any formal training for. And uh, that's why I recommend you know, uh, seeking volunteers and help and business consultants and things of that nature. And if I can share a really quick story, uh, early on, about three years into my first business, we, we kind of had some uh, accounting irregularities, and we needed to bring in a, a more qualified bookkeeper than we currently have, which was a childhood friend of mine. And uh, uh, my, you know, due to my CPA's advice, I, I took about uh, four or five months and actually learned bookkeeping on my own. And uh, this is, isn't something you want to do as a business owner, uh, but I did it because I needed to know the skills that it took and I needed to recognize those. Uh, if I needed to hire a painter, I would need to have some sort of uh, understanding of what a good paint job is. And so that was the same with bookkeeping. I, I wouldn't know how to bring one in if I didn't know what a really good one is. And I think being a good business owner is knowing a little bit about everything, but not knowing everything about one thing. And uh, so, you know, to answer the question, no, I, I really haven't had formal uh, experience, but of on the job training. I, I concur with that, and I want to kind of tie it to something George was saying uh, about the accounting and about the timing and about how you get rich and sell the business. From the beginning, what I would do is, and I, I had a guy that was from a big eight accounting firm. This was in an account, not a local guy that does income taxes. It's not about doing your income taxes. Get a, not just a reputable accountant, but somebody that is respected in the accounting field, like as if you were a publicly traded company. And I would have him do a quarterly B and P and L on our business almost from when it started. Part of the process is employee theft and. and the regularities, you've got an outside watchdog on that to alert you and to tell you where you're really at in your business. You kind of get a little lost in some of the cash flow things and think you're making money when you're really making other people's money and, and that sort of thing. So they're valuable in that respect. But the big thing is, when I went to sell my business, the guys who used to come in and find some little entrepreneur that's doing it all in the back of a napkin stealing from his own company and moving this to, to do that. And they have to unwind all that. They came in and I just threw them seven years of quarterly P&Ls, introduced them to the very reputable accountant and my bookkeeper and told them that if there were any questions they needed beyond that to be sure and bring them up. And they did a couple of times trying to get me into more of a negotiation value the company and I told them, I don't know, I don't really do any of this. And we went through the process again, I told them, here is my accountant and here's my bookkeeper. These people know about this. I asked them if I have enough money to do the next thing and their job is to tell me yes. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of it, this is an outside accounting firm that's very highly respected think of putting your reputation on the line for a little company like mine with seven years of absolutely definitive uh, documentation and that takes a lot of the risk thing out of the purchase and, and truly when you're running your company you don't want to make any money. You take any money that comes in and you put it back in the business because if you don't get to send it to Barack. You, you have to provide a payday for your employees, but you don't get one until you sell the company. And it's pretty good.
That's, that is really true. Seth, did you want to take a shot at that? Because I have, I have a response to it, too. So. I, you can go right at it. For, for me, again, the accounting is, it's, we keep circling this, this thing, but it's, it's incredibly important because, you know, as, as you go along, uh, for me, it's say in the case of Technosolvis and, and, and setting it off, uh, I took a four-year hiatus essentially to, you know, school of rebirth auto and athletics. And if it's not for the benchmarks that, and I, I got, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an economist by training, which is not a very good one. And, um, uh, but it, it provided me with, you know, basic common sense business accounting practices and, you know, a certain expectation. So I built a lot of uh, cost accounting uh, measures in, in the you know, manufacturing and production field. So that, you know, although I might not be uh, there on a day-to-day -day basis, I could still go back and uh, see how well or how not so well we're doing and, and then make changes accordingly. So it's, it's incredibly important. It also paints, as Jack puts out, uh, you know, sometimes cash flow, uh, money is the water. You know, you might be cashing a bunch of money, but money that isn't really ultimately yours. So knowing, you know, what it is you can uh, operate off of or move forward to further your goals and what actually is just going to sustain what you've sold is, is very important. And a lot of small businesses that, that, that I, I've seen fail is because they can't really tell what's theirs and what's not. And at some point, you got to pay the piper, so you got to be kind of uh, that. That's a, that's a great point. The, the question was, you know, do we have business backgrounds from, from college business education? And from my own perspective, um, I had you know, a couple of basic accounting courses in college. Um, but I think the answer that you're getting is, I think it's fairly no, no, sir, no, no, sir, I mean, None of us are MBAs, but I'd, I'd like to add a couple of quick things. Number one, there's two numbers that I'm concerned about every month, and I, and I call it keeping your, your fingers on the pulse of the business. Uh, I know what my monthly nut is. I'm sure that these guys know what their rent is, what their electric bill, telephone, salaries, all of it is. That's my monthly nut. I know what that number is. I know what the average profit on my motors are. So. If I don't sell this number of motors every month, I'm not making my nut. Those are the two numbers that are always in my head. How many motors am I selling? And you know how much is coming in, how much is going out? That's what's really important to me. The actual details, you hire an accountant from that. And if any of you are in an accountant here, I hope I don't offend you. Every accountant I've ever dealt with tells me what I want to hear. And that's why they I always, They will always paint a good picture of your company. Yes, sir. Even when it isn't doing well, and I'll give you a real quick story. I had my, my CFO come in to me one time and say, we've got to cut Ohio a check for $128,000 in sales tax for last month, or the federal government, I guess it was. And I said, no, we don't. He goes, yeah, you, know, you made that much profit last month. I go, no, I didn't. He goes, yeah, you did. And I said, no, I didn't. Don't tell me I did. I know I didn't. And now this is my chief financial officer, right? That's what, this is what he's supposed to be doing day in and day out. And I, I want to go fishing, right? And I'm arguing with him over it. And he says, you know, take a look at this report. And I go, the report's wrong. What had happened is um, we had received over a million dollars in inventory the last day of the month. The bill came two or three days later. So I'm showing this, you know, hugely inflated inventory and I don't have the bills to offset it. I knew how much money we were making, you know, why didn't he? You know, so accountants will always try to, they know if they don't paint you a rosy picture of your business, you're gonna go somewhere else. So I think it's important that you find it. Yes? I, I, I wanna keep on that one for just a second, George. You need to develop rules of thumb that put you in touch with your business that you understand. And here's a couple of cheap tricks. I watch the daily cash balance. Now this has some requirements, and this is a really good idea anyway. We pay the bills that come in the door on the day they're received, not that 30. And we don't do this because Jesus will love us. He already does. We do this so I don't count money that I have when it really belongs 
belongs to somebody else. And, and a quick way to get in trouble in one of my businesses is to let a bill lay around and not pay it. And I find out later I owe somebody $9,000 from two months ago. That's kind of a capital offense. So we pay all our bills when they come in, not because our suppliers will like us. I don't care. Um, not because Jesus will love us. I don't care if I do, but he already does. And so I can look at a daily cash balance and tell where I am and be able to see through the weeds he's talking about that they in formal statements will come up oddities. And I can look at that and say, oh, that's bullshit. Because I've got a couple of rules of thumb. And so, but the biggest trick is people trying to um, uh, work their receivables <laughs> and their payables uh, to their advantage. It's to your advantage to know how much you have to work with. Our salaries come last. I think that's what I've seen in successful small businesses is that the owner's salaries are the last thing to be paid. Absolutely. Go ahead. Uh, gentlemen, I uh, hold it um, uh, on a full board of serial potential for uh, wannabe. Um, there comes a moment when you have a couple of ducks in a row, and you've got a product and a passion and a thing and a team, and you know that to take it to the next level, uh, Jack called it last year OPA, the other people's money. Uh, there's an economy thing of this and that, there's the commercial route, you get in from a bank, there's private investors. Could one of you or all of you talk a little bit towards that first moment where you're securing a, uh, uh, an injection into your business, what, you're, what you needed to or were willing to give up at that moment, whether it came from private and one single individual that you were able to uh, convince of your future prosperity together, or was it a commercial thing or that kind of thing? Thanks a lot. Uh, our first living came from a bank, and uh, again, um, uh, you know, George did such a wonderful job of kind of hitting all the key points. And uh, I've never seen a business presentation that put up choosing your bank so highly on the list. And uh, it's so true. It's absolutely true. Uh, work with a small bank, uh, get to know your bank president, uh, and, you know, get the money will come. You, you know, in, in my, I'm going to roll back a little bit to the, uh, the account and tell you what you, what you want to hear. And, and, and in my case, in Technosola's case, and, and taking the business over, it was essentially a, a uh, dried up lemon when I took it over with uh, no clients, uh, some debt, and uh, really not a lot of, uh, it didn't look really good on paper. And my account, I actually suggested at that point that I could just get rid of it. And, and, and this is where the difference between accounting and business sense is, is really clear. I mean, you know, an accountant doesn't, uh, well, my accountant didn't have much perspective, but so when, when starting that business with no resources and we looked so bad on paper that nobody would lend us any money, it's just a matter of an incredible amount of work. And I, you know, I clocked 100 hour uh, week, uh, work weeks regularly for probably the first three to five years just to uh, prime the pump enough uh, for us to uh, rise, you know, to be, get on plane, so to speak, you know. And after that, you know, one, once I think once you show some good, you know, business basics, then uh, we went and shopped it out with some banks and got some good results. And, and then that funded uh, an accelerated uh, uh, growth. You know, we, we capitalized a lot of it, you know, equipment and whatnot. And it's just really, you know, good moves all the way around. And, and then at that point, you get in front of the wave, you get good cash behind you, and then you go have fun with it. And that's how I ended up. Our business. Yeah. Uh, I should really recuse myself from this vote of the judges, <laughs> and um, I, I kind of know something, and it would be very valuable to you, but you will not treat it with a um, adequate level of uh, willing suspension of disbelief. Uh, I started a business for $80 of my own money. I never put any of my own money further in it. And I sold it 11 years later for $38 million cash. I never borrowed any money at all. And I never had any investors at all. Now, I want to suggest something that you're going to find a little radical. But all businesses are sales-based. If you can't sell, you can invent, you can innovate, you can design, you can productize, you can package. 
if you can't sell, there is no business there. There never was. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to, I hate to pick on Nabil, for example, um, but he has no resources and he wants to be a conversion shop and so forth. He went out and found somebody with a um, kind of a, a dead lead as a car and convinced him that I, Nabil Hinky, can fix that car up for you and I can make him go. And the guy said, well, you know, I'd like that to happen. And so he's working on his first conversion and it actually in like six weeks. It's here. Free. It's free. <laughs> Sorry. What, what, but you talked about it for three weeks before you started. <laughs> <laughs> and, you and so it, 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 this is why I have the question with your boat and so forth. It, if you can do it, you can sell it. And if you can't sell it, there's no point in doing it. So it's a little bit of a circular argument about resources that almost doesn't matter. Um, you need to test yourself up front. Can I sell? Because if you can't, you need to find a job. And, that, and that's the way it is. Business is driven by sales. If you're one of these guys who say, well, I'm not very good at sales, trust me, it's an acquirable skill. <laughs> and you should go acquire that as the next official step because that's what it's about. And it's about establishing a belief system, finding somebody with a need and convincing them that you can fill it. And if you can't walk through that and do the sale, <coughs> you need to apply for a job. You're not going to be a player. And if you want to be a player, you have to be able to present the case for the product you think would be appropriate and either make the sale or the guy gives you some feedback and you go back and redesign your product a little bit. But until you have it where somebody would pay to have that, they have the desire to have that and would part with Yukons in a very sincere decimal fashion. I mean, that's what drives all these businesses. We question here. He has a microphone that will get you just like to go back to the uh, passion for what you do. Uh, I worked for a large computer company for 30 years. Starting with punch cards and you go on, a, on the computers and, and then on to software. And early on, one day it struck me that weekends were an interruption in my work. And so I would ask you guys, how many of you feel that way, that, that weekends are an interruption in your work? They're not an interruption in mine. I resent showers. <laughs> and I find them annoying. I, I think you'll find that everyone up here eats, sleeps, breathes, what the chances when they do sleep. You've, you've got to be driven. That's the drive that I was talking about. You have to have that drive. We look at it, but we, we love what we do, so we look at it as just you know, an extended hobby. Tried to make money if you just do something that you really believe in and have a lot of fun with it. Uh, you know, I know it's cliche, but the money will come. I go to sleep with a problem every night and I wake up with two things to try in the morning. They're not solutions, but they're things I could try. Yes. Uh, there's three points I did the business. Uh, when you first start your, your business, you, you use your uh, cousin's wife as your accountant uh, for the first. Year or so, don't be afraid to go find the next layer of accountant that's better for you. You know, don't start out with somebody that gets a job done and then get a partner or something to do, but the door that makes you more comfortable. Um, there's another point you can only surround yourself with good people. I, I bet you every one of you have excellent workers that you feel very comfortable with that carry the letter with you and for you, and some people around you that make the difference a lot of times. I, I feel I have excellent friends. Yes, I mean, and, and it's your, your the workers, your co workers, the people you hire. You got to pick good people. I agree, um, but I'm, I probably do it differently than most of them up here. A lot of people take care of their employees and they baby them and praise them a lot and make it a very pleasant workplace. EBTV is a terrifying place to go in the morning. <laughs> 
and I beat them unmercifully until they drop. But what I do do is I do pay the big paycheck on time. But you should, there is an opportunity to share a little bit of the drink. You, you can put them in on the plane. Here's where we're going. Here's what we're going to do, team. Here's what you're part of. Here's why you're important to me. Here's where we're going. And they start to become little mini players. And they get a little addicted to it. Everybody wants to know what happened to Brian. It's worked for me five times. I'm a very hard guy to work for, but I still get emails from people that worked for me for 12 years ago, and none of them ever liked me. But they got addicted because the phone would ring and it's John Dvorak or Bill Gates or somebody from Sun Microsystems. There's something going on all the time. We're out, we're going to take over the world, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And I kind of try to let them vicariously share in that without having to be at risk. And, and so that's how I get people on the team. And everybody that manages that differently when you think every company has a little different culture and how they relate to their employees. But George is exactly right. Uh, I ran a magazine for two years by myself as an experiment to see what could be done. And I found the limits. And after that, One is that when you, uh, sometimes you can't sell yourself, you, think you need to find a salesman. Salesmen are a different breed. They enjoy selling for the joy of closing the deal. They don't care what they sell. They'll sell stuff you can't produce. So you got to really, really, really be careful if you hire somebody just to sell for you. I mean, you've got to know what you're doing there. You're, you're your own best salesman a lot of times. I think in many ways also, you kind of, uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a nod duck around these two because I think they, they have much better people skills and managerial skills. So to me, you know, but I have an unstoppable amount of energy for whatever I'm pursuing because nothing will stop me. That's this strange thing, but I play my strength and I push <laughs> my weaknesses and try to find people around me who have good interlocking skills. You know, you, you talk about sales and it, it's true that especially in small businesses, I mean, cash flow will take you a long way, but you know, every business is sales driven. Product is very important. Product facilitates sales and you know, it's kind of hand in hand, but at the end of the day, you got to bring money in the door. And, you know, in my case, I felt perhaps this was not the, uh, you know, my, my strength per se to do uh, you know, cold call closing and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I've given up a good chunk of uh, pleasure in my life having, uh, you know, special What I'm getting at is salesmen are a different breed. Yes, I concur. Uh, but, but, but secondly, sometimes, you know, you just have to find the, the piece of the puzzle that fit your, you know, your, your puzzle. The last point, I'll pass it to the floor. If you build a company to sell it, just, just remember, when you start out with two or three people, companies grow in size. You start out with two or three people, and when you go to 10 to 24, it's a big difference because you start to get into the layer management. You've got to have somebody manage it because you cannot run 24 people yourself. You have to depend on other people to help you that. And then about that 24, when you get to 16 to 24 people, then look at it. It's either time to sell it, or you better really gear up because you're going to get into the big time. Things change drastically at the next level up. There's two levels, the low end, and then things take off. There's all sorts of variations to that. But I, I agree point completely, point. and this is kind of, we, we need to get back to convention, but I'm so wrapped up in this. This is cool for it, thanks. Uh, that's a heroic a point often overlooked. What you can't be the side you want to be except for 15 minutes on an afternoon. And you're always kind of at the wrong size. So you're too little to do the next thing. And if you acquire the people, uh, the uh, capital resources, I mean like equipment and space and so forth, to do that, 
then you have to have faith that that business will be there to support that. There, it's not really a linear thing. So you reach a plateau where you and everybody in the place is doing all you can. And you can't do any more business without expanding. But the cost of the expansion and the more space, more equipment, more people, and so forth, you have to do this, I call it plateaus. You're plateaued, and you have to step up to the next one. And it, it can be, what is it, very exciting fear, and terrifying. Exciting and terrifying. It's the fear of zeros, Jay. It's a fear of zeros. Yeah. But uh, because once you're there, then you have to sustain that level of business to support that structure. You have to have the structure to do the business, and then you have to have the business to support the structure. So, so it's not a linear thing. It's not a nice, neat, linear thing. You're plateaued here, and you have to jump up here. And about the time you get comfortable here, next step. And it's like a, a step through this thing. So you're in a little 150 square foot office and three computers and three people, and then all of a sudden it's 12 people and, and, and 1,400 square feet, and the next thing you're buying a building, and you know, so it, it's, 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 knowing, it's knowing it's your limits, steps. knowing your limits, knowing what you do best, and do what you do best, and do what you enjoy. And another thing George mentioned, uh, that, that I don't know how to tell you to do this, I don't even know how I do it, but timing is critical, and it's much better to be lucky than good. <laughs> Uh, hi. My name is Andrew McCleary, and you guys are probably also standing up here, um, and you might have heard high voltage hot rods. Um, I actually started the business about four months ago, so we're definitely a startup. Um, but I started out converting the GT40, which some of you have seen on Jack's show. Um, just to kind of clear the air here a little bit, Jack contacted me the other day about coming up here and doing this. Um, we were. Uh, I mean, I was just overwhelmed with all the stuff that I'm doing right now to get things set up and to start. Uh, we're going to be doing a television show as well. It'll be much, much, much different than what Jack's doing. We're um, going more towards the consumers. You guys will probably all get bored watching our show, but it's more about selling the cars and the idea to the hot rod and supercar people. And just, I think it's a, a matter of educating everybody about what it is that we've all, we're all doing. And the show's not really going to be just about our shop. It's going to be about everybody. So, um, But anyway, when Jack called me up, um, I was very busy with all this stuff. And he kind of gave me the opportunity and the push to come out here, which I really did want to come out here. Uh, so I will thank him very much for that, um, that little push. Uh, and I've enjoyed coming out here. And for me, uh, I've been in the television industry for about 20 years. So I see a lot of my world through the lens and enjoy actually watching it through the lens and developing that kind of thing. But uh, this is actually my third business that I've started. I've kind of gone up and had some successes and actually kind of burned out on them. And for me, it wasn't necessarily a matter of going, I'm, I'm a workaholic. Um, it wasn't a matter of going out and going fishing again. It was actually going out and becoming an employee for a while. Uh, with a larger company and learning something about what it was that I was kind of wanting to possibly do next. And um, the one thing I can tell you is that if you're going to get into business, the more and more that you can learn about that industry or if you can go in and work for somebody else for a little while and kind of learn and ask them about what it is that they're doing and what it is that works and what it is that doesn't work, uh, you can learn a lot about that before you go out and start doing it on your own. Question right next to you. My name's uh, Jeff Gannon from St. Pete, and uh, I have a question about the, the EV business, I guess. Uh, these, you know, driving uh, businesses in general, you know, I get that, but I, um, about five minutes away from me with Auto, and I think the electric cars are cool, so I went down there about a year ago, I met Sebastian, and I remember a statement he made to me. He goes, he pointed to pick the souls and said, we make the money there, and we spend it here. Every year it's auto. <laughs> that was about a year ago, and I'm just curious about, you know, do you have any projections of numbers on, you know, the EV business? And, uh, yeah. and what do you predict there? Well, fortunately, uh, 
last year we were on track to for for Evanetics in particular uh, on track for uh, profitable year. We ended up with a break even year, and this year for me was my line in the sand where we had to, you know, uh, rectify not not really rectify our direction, but just kind of get better at what we do uh, to make Evanetics and Rebirth Auto profitable, and, and we made some. Uh, in the case of Rebirth Auto, we realigned a little bit of the type of business we were willing to do, and that helped with profitability. And Evnetics, which was on track for it, uh, we just kept uh, steadfast with our with our progress. We uh, made a lot of changes, and now it is, as I, as I said in my earlier presentation, uh, you know, it is sustainable at the current level, and, and, and nicely too, pretty pretty good return. Uh, I also had to go and. Solar business and, and uh, kind of give it a little shot in the arm and need it after uh, four years of of uh, kind of running unattended uh, and that uh, that helped out quite a bit. So I'm, I'm happy to report that you know all three businesses are making money. You know and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but at the same time, you know there was a significant capital investment on my part that I. Will eventually recoup, I'm sure, get back into it somehow. But uh, uh, you know, but uh, yeah, what I what I learned for you know, if, it, if you're a small business with you know limited resources, at some point you got to draw the line, and you know you got to cut your losses, or, or you know you, you, you have to say. For me, it was you know we're at the fourth year of this, and, uh, you know, and if we can't turn a profit, then evidently we're not we're we're wasting time. You know, I, I love I'm passionate about the industry. Mind you, and that this drives a lot of what happens. But at some point, these businesses have to become real businesses. And to everyone here that's trying to do this as well, I would try to, you know, make that and make that a goal. You know, run with your passion. But ultimately, we're all in this to make make it work from a business perspective. Yeah. I'd probably take the other end of that and suggest that at the end of uh, your, I was 33 years old doing my income tax. And notice that I had made that year exactly 10 times what I had the previous uh, 10, 10 years ago. Uh, I was making 10 times the money from 10, the 10th anniversary year previously and was saving less. Um, I worked 30 hours a week, probably one of the best jobs I'd ever heard of anybody having. I was ridiculously overpaid, so I would leave. Um, and had insurance out the wazoo. I was kind of uh, miserable about all that. And I said, well, I'm sitting here paying these utility bills and these mortgage payments. If I like pay off the mortgage and, and have a 100% attendance record on the utility bills, at the end of my life, what, what are you going to do? Is there like a, a band? Do they have a party? Is there a parade? How does this work? So I started looking around. They had people in their 70s and kind of at the end of that after living honestly, paying their bills, and doing all that. And it, it occurred to me that they were kind of in white rooms full of white people wearing white clothes who were all very concerned about them and their welfare. And, and of course, most of all, whether they could get one more billable procedure into the government before they passed from this earth. And I quit my job the next day. <laughs> uh, it, it was over. You aren't really out until you declare yourself out. I can lose money for four years or seven years or ten years or a hundred years. As long as I can get enough oxygen to do the next week, I'm not out. I, I'm the only one that can declare myself out and say, hey, this is a write-off. Now, that's not really a prudent decision. And I would suggest that you do better with um, uh, Sebastian's realistic approach to that. Um, but for me, uh, and, and I've seen guys that have gone bankrupt six or eight times, lost their houses and so forth, and then did very well on number seven uh, or number eight. Um, it, it's, it's not like baseball. You have three strikes and you're out. You're the only umpire. When you quit, you get up out of bed and go do it again, and it's over. If you fail one time and quit, uh, that, that's sad. That's if, what? if you fail one time, if you try one time and you fail one time, 
that, that's sad to me. You know, you have to get up. You have to have the drive. You have to have the ambition. You know, um, well, well, that gets into kind of a value judgment about failure itself. And this is going to shock you even more. I really don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about what I'm doing. Because I don't know what piece, what I did, I could leave out next time and still win. I've got a pretty limited data set. Yes, there's lots of applause and it all feels good, but I don't know very much. Every time I have a significant failure or setback, if I don't make excuses for it and don't rationalize it, I can look in and every single time tell exactly what I screwed up. And now that's information. So I get in this kind of inverted thing where I don't really care so much that we win, but I focus a lot on what we fail because that's where the information is. This is where I can always get something real, so a hard nugget of a tape or don't do that again. There's no point in trying successive data points of how to close a green leaf over a cable cutter over a live wire <laughs> just to see if it still do it. <laughs> but if I plug a plug into the wall and it works, I don't know what part of that I, I could have left out. <laughs> We've got two more quick questions. <laughs> PLI, product li PLI, product, product liability insurance. Yeah, it does. I, I'm, I'm going to shock you again by dealing with the other owners, end of it. They have to have it. You have to have it. They won't deal with you. We, we have to give certificates of PLI to the OEMs. Unfortunately, the government in a lot of situations require you to have insurance. I had to have an insurance certificate to do the thing down at the airport. But in general, I avoid insurance because it attracts lawsuits. That's true. They don't tell you how much you have to have. They just want to make sure you have it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you uh, spoke about the seat. Well, some people say a success that I've had recently being able to come here with a car that's not even mine um, and doing it in three weeks. Uh, I kind of want to get a little bit of feedback. Um, I really hear what you're saying about having a dedication, having that, that striving endeavor, having that sickness of doing everything you can. Um, I am doing this without a lot of resources. My day job gives me fantastic access to what I have, so I'm incredibly thankful for that. Um, I can't exactly quit my day job and continue building my business. Um, that would be a humongous setback. Uh, but I've been doing overtime at work. I've been working the car until two in the morning, morning basically. Uh, the day before my clients came down here, uh, I was sitting in Jack's shop uh, in the passenger seat, babysitting the charger. Um, I kind of want to report card from you guys. I mean, is this insane? Am I doing it in the right direction? Well, uh, uh, does, does it feel like work to you? I'm here like that. <laughs> no, does it feel like work to you? Is no, this drudgery or are you suffering? Not at all. Not You're enough. doing fine. Yeah. Doing Find something you like to do. Do a hell of a lot of it until you get really good at it. And they'll send you money in the mail. I don't know where it comes from or why. Do I have a smile on my face? <laughs> After I got that car finally charged, the first thing I did is I drove to the airport to get a shower, like Jack uh, refused to. And threw it sideways in front of a bolt that was on a test drive and asked them, do you like electric? I need to drink to come off my face. Uh, you know, no one else morning, so you missed the pitch. I showed him your uh, the meal actually day job is with a sign company, and he has designed these little electric emblems to go on the car and carry them in. And I think they're quite gorgeous, but the trick is using his knowledge from his day job, he's found some sort of a tape on the back of this thing. And I believe you could make a jacket out of it and hang yourself on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, about uh, 60 pounds per square inch, awesome stuff. We've actually got a couple of signs in the shop right now we're tearing apart that we put together last year because the powder coat failed. And we attached uh, individual letters like those, almost identical, to
to these signs, they are an absolute bear. To take off one letter is about a minute and a half, and we got to sign you know, three dozen letters. That's a lot of man hours. Uh, it's good stuff. Well, I wish you well, Neil, and all I can say is go, girlfriend. You'll, no, no one up here can tell you when the time is right. Right. You should have some sort of measurable progress. You know, uh, have fun, work late, but uh, you know, don't be spinning your wheels. Make sure that you're actually making some form of progress that you can measure. And the, the job and the business thing will sort of sort itself out if you'll work 100 or 150 hours a week. At some point, you will reach a point where something's got to go. That's the job. <laughs> but you got to learn to sell, baby. I do. We have a statement I don't go to work. I go to play. Very easy to play $200 a week. Or at midnight at 1 o'clock. Are you coming home here? Yes or no? Um, gee, another, two, another 20 amp hours and I'll be home. <laughs> this is how it goes. Day after day, week after week. Another real serial entrepreneur, you probably ought to be up here at the table, Rich Redman. My first familiarity with it, man's need a micro had nothing to do with electric vehicles. We were in the disc business back in the PC days. And he, he's on his third or fourth ro rodeo. And the point is, a hundred hours a week of doing something I love it is not hard work. And 20 hours of doing something I detest doing is too many. With the admonition that I, there's one proviso. Anything you do in life, no matter how much you love it, there's some housekeeping that goes with it. Bite down and just do it. Floor has to be swept. Counting has to be done. Whatever goes with it, you got to, got to bite down on that. It's the fishbowl all the time. <laughs> a couple of you are leaving and not going to my uh, uh, dinner of smoked prime rib and silver oak wine. I don't actually believe it. I think he's in error, but he wants to draw. He's agreed to give away a motor to an intent to be very generously agreed to give away a pork pine motor to one of our, our attendees uh, by a drawing. And uh, so he wants to do it now. Um, I'd rather do 